hello again, Al. What do you have there? Oh, you printed your own painting. I think you mean painted your own painting. Oh, you literally mean printed. I guess that makes sense now that I think about it. What do I think of it? Well, it's, um, it's quite logical. What's that you say? You've been receiving professional instruction. By who, may I ask? By Bob. Bob who? The museum's own art class instructor. Well, he... Are you happy trees? That's Bob. I really don't know what I was expecting. Um, Al, what would you say to me teaching you some art rules that might help you build on Bob's expert teaching? Excellent. You see, when making art, there are rules which can help us in knowing where to begin when developing our own compositions. A good composition that follows these rules will lead to a strong work of art that is both visually engaging and sophisticated. Not only can these rules be applied to our own work, but they can be used to understand and dissect the work of other artists, furthering our analysis of their works. The first rule on our list is one that is very easy to understand and implement, although not highly sophisticated. This is the rule of thirds. This rule is a method of compositional division that divides the picture plane into three equally sized sections, both vertically and horizontally. The result is a grid comprised of nine zones. This is a common compositional rule in photography. Here is what the grid looks like overlaid onto an artwork. You see here the four intersections making the four corners of the central zone. They are the primary points of interest in this type of layout. Look at this image titled Cook by artist Judith Linhares. In this image, we see that the grid illustrates some of the underlying compositional structure at play. The figures are isolated on either side of the central column containing the fire. The spatula is located close to one of the four intersections, as is the right-hand figure's face. Directly on the lower horizontal line is the frying pan. In this case, we have a cyclical area within which the eye maneuvers thanks to the compositional layout, a fact seen when analyzing it using the rule of thirds. While this is a good rule of thumb to keep in mind, it is very important that we remember the limitations of this grid system, as there are more complex layouts that will lead to more sophistication within our compositions. Um, perhaps we should move on. Quickly. Now that we're out of that sticky situation, let's discuss the rule of odds. Like you, Al, our brains are basically large computers, and as such, they prefer easily sorted and logical solutions to their data inputs. Knowing this, artists can generate visual interest by working against our brain's desire for these neat and logical solutions. This is most simply achieved by varying the numbers of objects in our images so that they are odd in number. This forces our brain to work on finding a solution to categorizing this data, and the side effect of this is visual interest, as our brains find this type of problem solving more dynamic than its preferred easy solution. Such dynamic structuring is even found in non-objective art. Take for example this work by Naotaka Hiro, known as Untitled or Ares. In this image, we see Hiro using the rule of odds in his structures. Look at the large white shapes that bisect the image. You'll notice that there are five of these. This cluster of round egg-like shapes is comprised of nine shapes in total. Here there are seven stripes, while here there are four, which breaks the rule of odds, but generates contrast as a result. You see, Al, the rules are just guidelines, and knowing when to violate the rules is just as important as knowing when to use them. Do you get this so far, Al? Good. But keep in mind, things will get more and more complex as we go. Thomas Cole's view from Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts, after a thunderstorm, or often called the Oxbow, is a really good example of our next rules. These are the rules of entrance and of atmospheric perspective. The rule of entrance states that a path of progression starting from one of the edges of the composition and extending toward the interior of the composition will provide easy access into the composition itself. This makes sense if you think about it. We are following a visual path, just like in this image here. In the painting The Oxbow, we follow the river along from the lower right-hand corner and we follow it along its path till we reach the central focal point of the painting, which just happens to be the oxbow. This technique is used in all sorts of paintings and photographs, whether it is a table, a path, a floor, or even an arbitrary shape. The results are the same. We tend to see this as an entrance into the work and are visually compelled to follow the path until it reaches its fruition. Also at work in this piece is atmospheric perspective. This is generally limited to works that deal with space, such as landscapes, but can sometimes be found in other places as well. 
The rule of atmospheric perspective states that as objects go back in space, hues and values merge, edges soften, resolution lowers into an ether, and in certain atmospheric conditions, things become lighter overall and cooler. Look at this cityscape. Here we can see where the buildings begin to disappear into a fog or haze that is caused by the thickening of the atmosphere as the objects get closer to the horizon and recede into space. This is evident in the Oxbow when we look at the mountains in the distance. Here they turn a bluish purple and become cool silhouettes on the horizon. On the left hand side of the image we see this in effect in a nearer plane, a result of the thunderstorms effect. Something that you might want to also consider when painting is the reverse of this effect. If the background can fade into atmosphere, could we not also fade the extreme foreground to add a similar effect? The answer is yes. This type of effect can be seen here in this picture. Here we get an almost abstracted overlay caused by the hazy foreground object contrasting with the in-focus middle ground. This pulls our focus strongly towards the center of the composition as a result of the in-focus subject being enclosed by two types of out-of-focus or hazy areas. Uh, yes, Al, sort of like a sandwich, although that analogy is a bit awkward for a robot. Speaking of awkward segues, let's move on to our next rule. What? N no, Al, I didn't load the picture in the wrong way. It's supposed to look like that. No, the artist didn't run out of room either. This is a painting by David Bromley titled Swing Set, and it is employing our next rule. Oh, good gracious, no. No, Al, it's not the rule of beheading. Would you stop showing that? It's a dummy, but still. It's the rule of awkwardness, Al. Bromley is using the rule of awkwardness, just like this whole discussion. Here Bromley has awkwardly cropped the heads from the girls on the swings. The result is a visual curiosity as to why the crop exists in the first place. It essentially breaks the rules of good composition, and because of this makes the viewer ask why, thus generating visual interest. Bromley only uses one large crop in this image, but the crop is clearly intentional. This is likely because of two reasons. The first is that he has cropped the heads and the hands of the girls together unifying the crop and making it feel more intentional. Secondly, there is a border around the image that clearly shows that he is framing this image with the crop as an intentional element. Ideally, for this rule to take effect properly, we must have more than one crop. However, two is usually not enough either. To make sure this rule seems sophisticated in its execution, or, or rather design, three or four crops are better. See, just like this. They say that curiosity killed the cat. Al, don't even think about it. It means that people are naturally curious about the unknown and that some people get into trouble because of it. However, in art, we want to use this curiosity to add a lure to our compositions. In fact, this is the name of our next rule, the rule of allure. The rule of allure states that when objects, figures, or scenes are partially obscured from view, the effect creates even more of a desire for us to see them. Look at this painting by Vermeer titled The Art of Painting. You see, he uses the curtain to build our curiosity about what might be behind it. No, you can't go look, Al. It's not actually there. It just... How in the... Welcome back, Al. What's that? You found something weird back there? Oh, this is an artwork by Guillermo Cuica. It's part of a series, but this one is titled The Ring, Opposite Direction. <laughs> no, Al, the artist didn't glitch when he was making this piece. He is implying movement. Well, movement in art is a little different than in real life. You figure that this image is static. It doesn't record changes over time. It is a singular moment in time. Because of that, the artist who wants to show movement must imply it in the way they work. This is a good example of that. The twisting movement in the center is implied movement, or the illusion of movement. You'll see this all through art, because it is part of the rule of motion. However, there is more than one part to this rule, and sometimes these parts are even combined. What do I mean? Well, look at this piece by Van Gogh. That's right, this is Story Night, one of the most famous works in the world, and one that owes much of its success to the movement captured in the work. Here we see an example of an artist using the rule of motion in both its implied and recorded varieties. The implied motion is very similar to Kuitka's work. Here we see the movement of the clouds implied by the swirls in the sky. However, we also see recorded motion. 
While it's recorded because the artist's physical presence is made obvious by his brush strokes. We can see how he used the brush, how he physically moved to create this piece. There is action in the work. You can picture him building these short, choppy brush strokes to build the sense of movement throughout. You see a lot of this type of recorded motion in contemporary painting, with wild, almost uncontrolled brush strokes that streak across the canvas. However, not all movement needs to be recorded so boldly. Sometimes the record of motion, or the implication of motion, is quite subtle and almost perfectly still. Doesn't this piece just look like it come to life at any moment? You know, we talked about movement, but there is more than one type of movement in painting. There is the movement of the paint and the painted elements within a composition, but there's also the way in which the artist directs the movement of our eyes. What? Oh yeah, or optical sensors. These movements are called pictorial thrusts. This rule states that pictorial thrusts move the eye from one spot to another and create unity. They also bring importance to the areas that they pass through and point to. Think of it as an artist pointing their finger at what they want you to see. Look at this untitled work created by William Sassnall of his wife Anka. There is a great deal of pictorial thrust being used here. In fact, it is the primary rule at play in this whole composition, as every part of the composition leads us to that main focal point. Now, this is an extreme example, but it's also a very clear one as to the effectiveness of this technique. Here's a more common photographic example. Here we can identify a couple different visual thrusts. One stems from the staircase. It leads our eye to this group of people on the left, then angles along this negative space to the people in the lower right. Or we might start with this group on the upper left, follow that same path, and then work our way back the line here to the stairs, which will then reset us on that first path we took. You see, the artist is leading our eyes through the whole picture, but more subtly than Sassnall did. The alternative to this rule can also be used, but rather to create complexity within a composition. You see, rather than leading our eyes to one focal point, you can do what Kendi Scharf has done in this work, Moda de Mangu. Here we see a group of white birds, but none of these birds look in the same direction. This forces our eyes to continually follow opposing paths and then reset into the center of the canvas. This intentional disruption of eye flow forces our brains to compensate. And like with the rule of odds, our brain becomes engrossed in solving this peculiarity. Thus, the artist creates visual interest and mild frustration. Oh, it's a chameleon. A really, really big chameleon. Anyway, they can change color depending on their surroundings. Hey, Al, watch this. Do you see how the chameleon stands out more on some colors than on others? That is because of contrast. The rule of contrast says that the more similar a color is to another color, the less contrast there will be. Therefore, the work will feel more unified. However, the bigger the contrast, the more the elements will stand out from one another, causing tension. This means that the artist can manipulate this to create visual interest in their work. What is even cooler is that literally anything can cause contrast in your work. Not just color, but light, pattern, hard edges versus soft edges, and so much more. Let's let our chameleon friend catch his breath while we look at this work by Mary Weatherford. This piece, titled Coney Island 2, works extensively with contrast. First, look at the contrast created by the dark central shape placed on the white canvas. This same shape is contrasted by the bright lights that she has attached to the canvas. These lights are linear, and this contrasts with the organicness of that dark background. Also, the lights themselves contrast each other by leaning in opposing angles. So you see, all types of contrast can be made from various sources when you create art. Hello, Al. Al. Welcome, 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 welcome. To the 80s. Come back. back. I'm sorry, Al. Al. I just thought I'd have a little fun with you. I didn't mean to scare you. you, you, you.
This is a work by Julian Stanzik called Burning Through. It reminds me of the 80s, though it predates that era by a few years. What I really wanted to show you was the use of repetition in this piece. Stanzik is really utilizing the rule of repetition here. The rule of repetition, also known as the Gestalt Law of Similarity, states that as elements repeat more, then more unity is formed. It also states that similar objects, or shapes, are grouped together by our minds. You see, here we have multiple layers of repetition at play. We have those pink vertical stripes that repeat, but we also have those tiny vertical lines that create gradients within their own columns. And these repeat. The columns seem to be made up of squares comprised of blue and green triangles, which also repeat in a diagonal. The repetition in this piece creates unity and visual rhythm to the work, which can be thought of as a visual beat. Al, you remember me mentioning those lines creating a gradient in that last piece? Well, there's a simple rule that applies to gradients as well. This rule of gradients says that they create both unity and complexity simultaneously. How? Well, let's look at this work by Helmut Federal, titled Ferner D for Robert Frost. This work is about as simple as they come, but also very aesthetically pleasing. The reason is the use of that gradiated ring. The ring shares the same colors as its background, but with a gradation in the value. The value gradation means that while unified by its color, there is also visual contrast that builds complexity. Does that make sense? Um, not quite the same thing, Al. Perhaps we need to further discuss minimalism. All right, Al, tell me what you see. A tree. Okay, but look closer. Still don't see anything, huh? How about if I do this? See the gorilla? How about the lion? Perhaps the fish? What about the frog? No, how it's not magic. This logo for the Pittsburgh Zoo is a really good example of the gestalt theory of closure, sometimes referred to as the rule of spontaneous generation. You see, we tend to group visual elements for easier processing, and we also finish objects that might not have all the visual information in place. This allows us to see objects easier and generates a great deal of complexity and unity visually. Now we do tend to see this in logo design quite a bit, but it's also used in art. Salvador Dali used this technique in some of his surrealist paintings, and contemporary artists use this same technique to build visual interest as well. Look at this piece by Gabriel Orozco, titled Kite's Tree. Here we see a lot of this mental closure at play. We generate circles mentally, along with partial shapes and arcs throughout, creating a very compelling and visually interesting work. However, this is not the only way this rule works. In this work by Philip Perlstein, titled Two Models, One Seated on a Floor in a Kimono, we mentally complete the scene, even though they are cropped. We know that the lower woman's legs end at the knees and continue by folding under her. The upper figure doesn't just end at the waist, we know that she too continues upward, as does her chair. Our ability to fill in details is what keeps this style of composition from feeling disjointed and undecipherable. This can still happen though, it's a matter of knowing when to stop and when to keep going. A good lesson for any artist. Okay, let's move on to the rule of enclosure. This is a slightly more advanced rule. What do you mean we just did this one? No, Al, that was the rule of closure. This is the rule of enclosure, as in keeping something in, like a fence or border. 
Enclosures are actually quite sophisticated in terms of composition. Using arabesques, circles, and ellipses creates elegant and dynamic continuity within a work. Here are two good examples of how this works. First, look at this work by Mary Cassatt called The Boating Party. Here we see an arabesque enclosure created by the boat's shape. This is emphasized by the water's arc on the left-hand side of the boat. This works to enclose the figures and draw our attention to them. And, in this case, the arabesque shape brings our attention to its point, that being the mother holding her baby. Thomas Scheibitz uses this technique in his work Map 1, or Old Map. Here we see an elliptical enclosure that is created by the arc in the red shape on the left-hand side of the composition. This interior enclosure follows through into the blue arc along the bottom, and thanks to the rule of closure, we finish the loop in the upper right-hand corner automatically. This works to keep our eyes centered on the canvas. You can think of it as a walling or fencing off of various aspects of the composition for your viewer. You can also think of it as a coincidence. The blue arc coincidentally lines up with that red arc, and so it creates an enclosure. You see, often it's best to imply these enclosures occurring naturally. This keeps the viewer from perceiving how you are guiding their eye. Well, now that that's sorted, let's look at some more Gestalt laws, shall we? Um, ow. Ow. Wake up, buddy. Glad to see you're back on your feet. Or, whatever those glowy things are. The next rule is the Gestalt Law, but a rather easy one to understand. Look here at Primavera, painted by Sandro Botticelli. This is personally one of my favorite works. Here we see Botticelli using the rule of proximity to help us understand who belongs with who. You see, we tend to automatically group things that are in close proximity with one another, whether they are overlapping or just simply near each other. This is because it is easier for our brains to calculate two groups of three rather than six individual pieces. This penchant for grouping makes this rule one of the quickest and easiest ways to unify elements within a composition. Simply place them near each other. You see, Botticelli has isolated the central figure of Venus in this work by leaving space around her and moving her slightly backward in space. The three graces, on the other hand, are grouped together as they dance in a circle. Note that they are also of a similar color palette, which helps with their unification. To their left is another isolated figure. This is the figure of Mercury. He looks away from the graces, and there is a slight distance between his main body and the graces that separates them from one another. On the right side of the composition is what I think to be the most interesting use of this rule. Here we see three figures. We have the March Wind Zephyrus on the far right. He swoops in, invading the grouping that is occurring between the two women. The figure that Zephyrus is grabbing is Chloris. Note her position as she leans forward, associating herself with the other woman, but still feels slightly isolated. Zephyrus has almost the same effect in his positioning, but not to the same degree. The reason this is interesting is that the woman Chloris is being associated with is the goddess Flora, whom she turns into after being caught by Zephyrus. Thus, we see why she is somewhat associated by proximity, but not fully. That is not a flying baby monster. That's Cupid. Whoa, whoa! Why is this even in an art museum? Yes, I know, it makes me dizzy too. That's because it plays with our equilibrium. You know what? I just figured out what this is here for. It's called a cheap segue. And sorry, Al, it's hard to keep up with good material. Our next rule is the rule of equilibrium. Yeah, bet you didn't see that coming. Anyways, this rule states that we desire visual balance in our designs. This also ties into another Gestalt law, which says that we perceive elements that are in balance visually as a set or whole. Now, there are two types of balance. There is symmetrical balance and asymmetrical balance. Symmetrical is a mirror image from one part of a composition to another, but this is rarely used in painting. Rather, we usually see examples of asymmetrical balance being used. Asymmetrical balance relies heavily on visual weight. Factors like breathing room, gazing direction, negative space, object size, value or hue contrast, contrast weight, planar weight, and magnetic momentum all come into play when trying to balance a composition that is asymmetrical. Size is probably one of the biggest factors in visual balance, as we are wired to think that big objects are naturally heavier than small objects. Also, objects in the foreground tend to feel heavier than those in the background, even if they are identical. This is what's called planar weight. Look at this work by Martin Mall called Spring. 
Yes, Al, he is the same guy from Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Ah, yes. Look at those fashions. Anyway, he's also an artist, and in this work, we can see how he has used the rules of equilibrium to balance the composition. The composition balances in an almost cantilever manner, with the figure of the boy counterbalancing the weight of the woman and the man on the couch. Notice they are cropped off, and thus feel more solidified with the dark shapes of the trees and shadows on the left side. This is the base of the cantilever. The boy is light-colored and stands towards the light portion of the image. Also, his planar weight feels increased because his proximity pairs him with both the house and the negative space of the sky and surrounding grass. This large area, although lighter in value and weight, effectively counters the much heavier left-hand side of the painting. The focal point is another way to effectively change the balance of a work, especially if it falls on one of the two types of diagonals that occur compositionally. The first is the Baroque angle. This goes uphill from the lower left corner to the upper right. Opposite of this angle is the sinister angle. It goes downhill from the upper left to the lower right. The reason this works is that most people read from left to right, so it occurs naturally as they scan the image. How can you use this in your work? Good question, Al. Let's first start with the Baroque angle. The lower we place the focal point on this diagonal, the more upward pull towards the upper right hand corner occurs. Think of it as a magnet pulling the object up to the hill. This is called magnetic momentum. The higher an object starts on this angle, the less this pull occurs, and the less balanced the work feels. The exact opposite of this is true in the sinister angle's direction. The further the focal point is to the top of the sinister angle, the more it feels as if it has momentum to roll downhill. The further we get to that lower right corner, the less momentum it has, and the less balanced it becomes. A good example of this principle is also found in Martin Mull's work, this one titled Nuclear Family. See how everything is laid out on that Baroque diagonal? The placement of the objects from large to small along this angle balances the composition. The clown creeps you out? Yeah, I have to agree. Uh, let's move on. Here we are, at the final rule, the rule of figure-ground relationships. Figure-ground states that the greater the contrast between the figure and the subject of a painting and its background, then the more clarity and dissonance occurs. In other words, this rule deals with how different elements in our paintings stand out against their backgrounds. The more contrast that occurs, the easier it is to see a figure. A really good example of this is the work Personage No. 5 by Marion S. Marion. In this work, we see that the contrast created by the light and brightly saturated colors on the figure stand out against that black background. This example is an extreme example, but it also brings up a great point. This is why visual effects artists use green screens. There is a high contrast between the actors and the screens. Thus, the computers can easily select the background and replace it with something else. So... This rule is used in many ways outside of just simply painting. Another way to increase contrast between the figure and ground is by using aspective view. This applies to actual figures. By using aspective view, the artist can make it easier for our minds to pick out figures against the background. You see, in these Egyptian figures, the face is turned in profile, making the features easier to see, and the arms are out of way from their bodies, helping us to understand their shapes. A less exaggerated version of this view is present in many of the works we already viewed, for example in Primavera. You see how the figures have their arms and legs away from their bodies and their heads are turned? That's a spectre view. Now there are times when you don't want a figure to stand out so heavily against the background. Take for example this work by Mary Lorenzen, titled Fairy Flowers. This composition would not work nearly as well if the figure stood out harshly against the background. The artist is presenting us a soft, almost ethereal feel, where the figures are one with their surroundings. Had the artist forced the figures away from the background, this illusion and sentiment would have been lost. So it is important to know how and when to use figure-ground relationships. Works like this one are far more unified in their design, and this harmony adds to the sense of ambiguity created between the figure and the ground as well. So there you go, Al. You have some new guidelines for making artworks. Now you just have to decide when to follow the rules and when to bend or break them. It's important to do both, and in doing so, you will create the best work you can. Don't forget, though, there are many more rules than we covered today. Perhaps you'll even find some of your own. The following Thursday. Hello again, Al. I see you're hanging one of your pieces. 
That's excellent. I can see you have improved a great deal since our last lesson. Granted, it's still a bit niche for my taste, but that is the beauty of art. Oh, I see. So this is only your latest work. You've been busy, I see. Um, Al? Al, we need to talk about copyright. Look at that. Isn't that a nice little tree?